Well, welcome everyone, and thank you to those joining us live, as to those listening in afterwards. I would also like to warmly welcome our guest today, whom I will shortly introduce later. I'm Professor Katia Caneiras, I'm a member of um, FIP Commission on Antimicrobial Resistance. I'm coordinator of the Microbiology Research Laboratory in Environmental Health of the Faculty uh, of Medicine, University of Lisbon in Portugal. And I'm also elected representative of the Infectious Disease Working Committee of the Portuguese Society of Pneumology. Previously, I have some announcements uh, to make. Please note that this event will be recorded, live stream on FIP YouTube, and will be available at our website. To all those listening, please feel free to send your questions to the questions and answer box, and we will be picking those to, um, throughout today's sessions. FIP would also went, want to thank Racket for supporting this uh, online uh, program. Thank you uh, for this support. As you know, FIP Vision is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality and affordable medicines and health technologies. Our mission is to support global health by enabling the advance of pharmaceutical practice, sciences and education. Well, we are pleased to be delivering this event, supporting self-care disinfection in common conditions, which is the, the episode number 11 of our program of 17 events of self-care shaping the future of self-care through pharmacy. As healthcare providers, pharmacists have an important role to play in supporting self-care. This program is composed of eight episodes that refocus on accelerating universal health coverage for all by enabling self-care through community pharmacy. Additionally, nine episodes will focus on self-care support for community pharmacy teams. Today, we'll be continuing the focus on accelerating self-care for universal health coverage. Um, here, we share with you the program of the, the event of today, and we also want to share with you the main four goals of um, the event. We are, I'm now pleased to be introducing our first panelist, Professor Sally Bloomfield. It is an honor to have uh, this such high level of uh, experts with us today. Professor Sally Bloomfield is the chair of the International Scientific Forum of, on Home Hygiene and is also honorary professor at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, professor Sally, please welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to present. Um, I, I happen to be a pharmacist by background, a pharmacy student, and I lectured pharmacy students for 25 years in King's College London uh, before moving on. And it's a delight to be talking to pharmacy uh, pharmacists again. In this presentation, I want to talk about how we re-engage the public to play their vital role in preventing the spread of infection. And there's no more um, important time to do this as we hopefully emerge from the COVID-19 and have to think what we need to learn from that. My presentation is going to be focused on community situations. I, I'm sure a lot of you are more involved in ho hospitals, but I hope the basic principles of what I'm gonna talk about is of relevance to all of us. First slide, please. I think um, over the last decades of the 20th century, we had a problem in that hygiene, people became increasingly uh, complacent about hygiene due to access to antibiotics and vaccines and so forth. But in this last 20 to 30 years, I think uh, that there have been a number of dramatic changes that have happened, which have brought hygiene back up the health agenda. And I just wanted to start briefly by uh, highlighting three of them, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but I just wanted to, to put them in perspective. Most obvious is, is the global pandemic of COVID. And if you look at the preparedness plans, which were being drawn up way back in 2003 onwards, they do clearly say hygiene is the first line of defense to mitigate infection before other measures uh, such as uh, vaccines and antivirals and so forth. 
can be put in place. But we really do have to ask the question as to whether enough um, uh, effort was put into making sure that the public were prepared to take on this role, were fully engaged, and whether the advice they were being given is appropriate or was appropriate. In the UK, our Prime Minister was telling us constantly to wash our hands frequently. But what you failed to talk about is when we should be washing our hands. There was an assumption that we all knew exactly what we had to do. The second uh, issue, which is equally important, is obviously tackling antimicrobial uh, resistance, where again, we know that the role of hygiene uh, in, in reducing antibiotic prescription, uh, antibiotic prescribing and the spread of antimicrobial resistance strains is one of the three key pillars of action. But again, if you look at um, the action plans, um, and I'm just quoting here the UK action plan, it really does say healthcare providers can only do so much when it comes to infection prevention, the public have a huge part to play. But if you look at it, the plans mostly focus on healthcare settings. There is little detailed reference to what we do with regard to the public. Apart from one, um, uh, which I'd like to mention, one um, uh, initiative, which is the what's called the e-bug program, um, which was set up in Europe to make sure that every child leaves school with a good knowledge of antibiotic resistance and uh, hygiene. The third one, uh, issue that I think we have to recognize is that particularly since 2000, we've seen this ever increasing population of people in the community at much greater risk of infection, probably living relatively normally in the community. And we believe it's at least one in five people, probably more. And I think COVID-19 has shown us the importance of hygiene in shielding these people. And it really means a need to ensure that they and their carers properly understand how to practice hygiene in order to protect themselves or the person they're caring for. Next. So in view of these changes, fundamental changes, I think it's become obvious that we require, it requires a fundamental rethink in order to develop hygiene, which is appropriate to the issues that we currently face. Next. One of the things the organization which I work with, the International Forum on Home Hygiene, has done in the last 27 years since it was established, was to develop a new approach to hygiene in home and everyday life, which has come to be known as targeted hygiene. And it's based on risk management approaches, which were developed since um, the 1950s to prevent con contamination of food and pharmaceuticals, et cetera, during manufacture. And I hope uh, as pharmacists, you will, like me, have been given a good grounding in processes of microbial quality assurance and has a, and understand what risk management approaches actually mean. Uh, for those who may be unfamiliar, it's about focusing hygiene practices at the times, we call the moments, and the places that matter to break the chain of infection. And I think this differs quite considerably from the way we saw hygiene during the 20th century, where we were very much concerned with the idea of keeping our homes clean, dirt being regarded as the main source of harmful microbes. And if COVID has taught us anything, I think it's that the public's perceptions are still very much rooted in the 20th century. And I hope to show you some examples of that uh, to, to, to illustrate what I mean. But I think one thing that exemplifies this very well is the images we have saw during the early months of COVID. The idea that disinfectant spraying uh, rituals, uh, public health workers fully believing or mistakenly believing that this is the way to, to make us safe. And little recognizing that, 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 that you can make a, a, a situation, a, a, an environment safe, but it's when people enter that environment that the risk begins. This lack of understanding that it's public hygiene behavior, which is the most important factor. Next slide, please. So let's have a look at what targeted hygiene is in practice. And I think, I hope you'll agree with me, that it's really relatively quite simple. Targeted hygiene depends on understanding the chain of infection, a very simple concept, the journey of the germ. And I'm talking about the home here, uh, where we see that the main sources of infection are places that are dirty. It's people, people who are infected, or as we've seen with COVID, people who are infected and infectious, but may not be showing any symptoms of, of, of being ill. 
It's also contaminated foods, contaminated raw foods, meat, fish, poultry, fruit, and vegetables. We also know that sometimes, not that often, our domestic animals can become a source of infection amongst family members. We know that when there's an infected source uh, within our home, then the organisms will be uh, being shed all the time into our environment, onto our hands, onto contact surfaces and into the air. What targeted hygiene is about is identifying those surfaces or situations which are transmitting infection in a way that we become, uh, the family members become info exposed and become infective. Because these are the critical surfaces, the ones we need to focus on at risk moments in order to uh, prevent uh, infection. And there's a very simple bottom line here. If we're not exposed to harmful microbes, we cannot become infected. Next slide, please. In developing this approach, what we've come to realize recently really is that um, if we look at what people do in their homes and if we look at the microbiology, there are in fact nine key moments in our homes and everyday lives when hygiene really matters. And I just want to introduce you to these moments. If you look at the top line, the first two relate to when people, infected people are present in our home and they're coughing and sneezing. And we now know from uh, COVID, it can include talking out loud, shouting, singing and so forth. It's when we're using the toilet, and I mean using the toilet, it's not just the toilet itself, it's what we're doing when we use the toilet. There are various uh, moments within that uh, whole um, scenario where there is risk of transmission of infection. The third relates to contaminated food and the process of handling and preparing raw food, and the fourth to caring for our domestic animals. The next four come further down the chain of infection. Most recently, we've become much more aware of surfaces which are frequently and recently touched by other people. And I think we have to distinguish these surfaces very clearly from those that are being portrayed as hygiene theatre. These are not hygiene theatres, particularly in our homes. They are, I believe they are an important route of transmission of infection. It also involves clothing, uh, particularly clothing in contact with our body, uh, which can transmit uh, uh, skin microbes and microbes from the bowel flora. It involves eating food with our fingers, knowing that our, our hands are one of the, la the, the last lines of, of defense. We could include here things like inserting contact lenses, uh, where there is a risk uh, from contamination on our hands. The last one uh, in this row includes uh, disposing of domestic um, uh, waste. The ninth one is, is quite different in that it's caring for infected family members. But in this situation, all of the eight moments apply. The difference is that when we're caring for infect infected family members, if we don't carry out uh, hygiene rigorously at all eight points, then there is greater risk of infection spreading throughout the family. What I have to say is that these are not the only moments for, uh, for hygiene, but if we can get uh, the public to visualize these key measures, they won't have to remember them, they can see them. These are visual prompts. It provides a sound basis for prompting action where and when needed, and we can uh, build on this in healthcare situations. Next slide. I said that it's uh, that uh, targeted hygiene is about places as well as moments. And I'm just going to give you two um, examples, uh, which I think is uh, the best way to illustrate what I, I mean here. The first is and the easiest one to visualize is when we're handling raw foods. And this is a chicken and it's very easy to visualize what are the, the uh, significant control points here. It's the utensils, it's our hands, it's the chopping board, it's the cleaning cloth, which we may use and then use to clean other surfaces. Uh, without, if we're, we're, we're not vigilant, um, uh, cleaning the cloth first, and it's anything we touch with our hands whilst we're carrying out that process. The message is that immediately after preparing raw chicken, we should clean and if necessary, disinfect these surfaces. If we do that, the risk is contained. There is no need to clean and disinfect the whole of our, our kitchen. That's what targeted hygiene is all about. Next. 
The other key moment I wanted to mention, because it's relevant to COVID, is when we're coughing and sneezing and nose blowing and so forth. The critical places here, again, are reasonably obvious. There was a lot of discussion during the early stages of COVID as to what were the critical points. And I think it's now agreed that the airborne route is probably the most important, uh, either droplets that, are, uh, that we uh, would infect when we're very in close range with other people, but also the tiny droplets can, that can travel considerable distances. Because uh, when we cough and sneeze and, and, and even now talking and breathing, we're spraying droplets into the air, these can get onto our hands and onto contact surfaces. This is the situation for COVID, but I think for other respiratory infections and other um, infections that are born uh, by the airborne route, I think the relative uh, risk from hands and contact surfaces to the air can be different. But you can see for COVID, eventually we ended up with this list of critical control uh, points, social distancing, ventilation, masks, hands and contact surfaces. Next slide, please. But of course, in talking about um, targeted hygiene, I was talking about the critical points. And I do think one thing that needs to be stressed is when it comes to risk management, it's not about saying which is the most important and which do we focus on. It's about intervening at all of them. And I think this is something that we've had problems with during COVID. People talking about, well, when can I stop wearing my mouse? When can I stop uh, disinfecting my hands before I go into the supermarket? The key to risk management is that we intervene at all significant critical control points, and we keep that up. We don't abandon some of them. They all work together to reduce the risk of infection. And I think as trained health care professionals, you may be, sorry, can you go back just, just one? I, I think as uh, trained healthcare professionals, you'll probably, um, you'll probably think that this is all uh, very obvious. It's common sense. But I really don't think it is. I think we have to get this basic principle over to the public. But I think an equally, uh, equally important part of targeted hygiene is what we do to break the chain of infection transmission. Next slide, please. And again, I, I, in order to break the chain of infection, what we need is it, um, effective procedures in order to do that. And again, I think we get tied up in so much um, detail that we tend to forget. There are some very simple underlying principles. And if we could get the public to understand those principles, they could then build on them in order to practice self-care in terms of protecting themselves from infection. The bottom line is that the purpose of a, um, of a hygiene procedure is to reduce the, the microorganisms on the critical surfaces at key mo moments to acceptable safety target levels. That is below the infectious dose. And of course, we do have a problem here in that the infectious dose can be very small for something like norovirus, but considerably higher for other organisms, for example, COVID or for uh, salmonella or something like that. One thing, something we sometimes fail to appreciate is that the same principles apply whether we're talking about hands, environmental surfaces, or we're talking about fabric items that we have to launder. There are two key ways in which we can reduce organisms to a, key, uh, to a safe level. One is to physically remove them from the surface. For example, when we wash our hands, we rub them with soap to detach the organisms. And then equally importantly, we rinse them under running water, which takes off the soap together with the microbes and leaves our hands hygienically clean. Alternatively, we can kill the microbes in situ using a disinfectant or a hand sanitizer or so on. But sometimes we don't appreciate fully that both processes have the potential to disinfect. In terms of science, a disinfectant is something that kills germs, but that is not the only way in which we can disinfect a surface. We can do it by removal. So there has often been a situation where people have said, we don't need disinfectants in the home. All we need is hot, soapy water. But if you look at the data, this ignores the evidence which says that, yes, in some situations, removal processes are enough if they are carried out correctly. But in some cases, a disinfectant is needed. And I'll just give you two examples to illustrate. First of all, it may be practical. Hands, we may have no access to, to, to soap and running water. 
in which case we need to use a hand sanitizer. There's been a lot of argument during COVID, which is best, a hand sanitizer or soap and water. Both, when it comes to COVID, are equally effective. It's about encouraging compliance and getting people to practice hand hygiene when they don't have access to a sink and might not bother. The other example is contact surfaces that cannot be rinsed. If you think about it, hand contact surfaces in our home, doorknobs, flush handles, toilet seats, we can't rinse them. Um, so, and also large surfaces like um, food contact surfaces, countertops. And we've found that surfaces such as cloths, it's quite difficult to rinse the organisms off the surface unless you do it immediately after use, they become firmly attached. So in these situations, it may be necessary to use a disinfectant. The, the pr principle that we have to get over is disinfectants should not be used for non-targeted uh, surface cleaning, i.e. what we've come to know be called the hygiene theater. Next slide. And I do think if we're going to be talking about encouraging self-care and getting people to make choices about when they, uh, how they, uh, how, um, what uh, hygiene procedures they use, that they need to have some understanding of how they actually work. You try asking people, how do you think hand washing with, with soap actually works to, to, to prevent the spread of infection? And what you may find is that many people or most people that I've talked to, uh, to believe that the sole purpose of rinsing hands during hand washing with soap is to remove the soap. They don't understand that it's a vital part of reducing contamination to a safe level. Next slide, please. Just one other aspect before I move on that I want to just touch on is this uh, what I've, I call sustainability. And it involves a number of things because when developing targeted hygiene, we felt that it offers the framework for maximizing protection of, of, of infection against infection. But what it also does is to deal with these sustainability issues. To us, it, it provides a method of discouraging obsessive use of cleaning products and disinfectants. In, in, in our homes, it minimizes environmental and safety issues. But the other thing that I want to measure, mention is this received wisdom that, uh, that low level disinfectant exposure, overuse of disinfectants in our ho homes is linked to the development of antimicrobial resistance. It's reserved, received wisdom, but I don't think that it is true. It's biologically plausible and if you look into the evidence, yes, you can see plenty of examples of uh, certain types of biocides that can, uh, it, it, on exposure to these biocides, they can be linked to reduced, uh, reduced uh, sensitivity of antibiotics to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, reduced resistance to antibiotics. But if you look at the evidence, there's no real evidence that disinfectant uses contribute in clinical practice as yet. But put all of these together, and I think it indicates we need prudent use of antimicrobial, um, uh, antimicrobial agents in our homes. But I think we need to make sure that we look at it from both angles. And sometimes I think we don't, because I think we can equally say that not using disinfectants where they're needed could contribute to increase in antimicrobial uh, resistance and increase the need for antimicrobial prescribing. So not using disinfectants could, in some instance, have a, 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 um, a, a um, an adverse effect in terms of encouraging antibiotic resistance. Next slide, please. So uh, although uh, we believe that uh, targeted hygiene provides an effective um, framework for developing effective hygiene, realizing the health benefits of targeted hygiene does depend on getting the public to adopt this approach. And I think this requires overcoming certain barriers to change. And I'm just going to focus on one of them. Next slide, please. And that is our concern, our increasing concern about consumers' understanding of hygiene. Do they understand hygiene? And are they, have they become very confused about how hygiene differs from cleanliness? 
And this became very apparent from an online poll, which we had the opportunity to carry out in 23 European countries in 2020, more than 4,000 panelists. And the results were published in a report, which I invite you to re read if you're interested. But I'm just going to pick out one um, example uh, to illustrate what I mean. Next slide, please. As part of the poll, we asked two questions of the uh, consumers that we talked to. In one part of the poll, we said, to what extent do you think uh, this following actions pose a risk of uh, infection transmission? And then later on in the poll, we asked them, how often do you carry out the following actions? What we did was then to match them up, and then we resorted them into those which, according to risk assessment, we would judge to be highest risk, and those which we would judge as relatively lower risk. And what you can see here is interesting results. As you might expect, probably the best known risks are associated with not washing hands after going to the toilet and after handling raw meat uh, or other uh, raw foods. And you can see in that situation between 86 and 89% said that these actions were high or medium risk. And what you can see is that 85 to 90% reported that they acted accordingly, i.e. they washed their hands in these situations. But if we then go on to something like uh, the cleaning cloth, which we believe is equally high risk, if it's not cleaned after each use, it can be a, a very good vector for um, moving contamination around to other surfaces, particularly touch surfaces, uh, which can lead to spread of infection. And you can hear, see here that less than uh, two thirds thought that this was high or medium risk and less, less than 50% acted accordingly. But if you then go down to look at what we call a low risk situation, what we would um, judge as a low risk situation, which is cleaning our, um, our, our floors in our bathrooms and in our kitchens, more than two thirds felt that this was high or medium risk not to use an antibacterial uh, in this situation uh, in order to clean these surfaces. And we found that uh, more than 60% said that they always or often used an antibacterial cleaner in this situation. So I think from this poll as a whole, as a whole, and as I say, this is only one example of the results, we became very aware that consumers, the public, have a relatively low understanding of the perception of risk and how hygiene differs from cleanliness. Next slide, please. So then finally, just I, what I want to talk about in the last few minutes is to talk about how do we re-engage the public in playing their part in preventing the spread of infection. Because I think as pharmacists with our unique background, which includes an understanding of sterilization and disinfection and risk management, we are in an ideal position to, to uh, play our part in, in re-engaging the public. I think there are three areas that we've got to uh, pay attention to. Uh, at um, in, in most obvious is improving public uh, uh, communication, but also a public health level and at government and health policy uh, makers level. I'm just going to talk about two of them as my time is short and I'm getting to the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. The first thing I think is at public health level. I think we have to realise that frontline hygiene is not a clinical issue. It is about risk management and needs to be a, a, a addressed as such. We as pharmacists live very much in a, 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 a world of, of hygiene professionals who are taught to work from clinical basis. I think that we need to think of hygiene as a, a risk management issue. And that means we need to recognize that the targeted hygiene approach, the risk manager approach is the way forward to developing hygiene promotion, which provides us with an effective approach. But the other thing I think we have to do is improve public communication. It's about government taking on the, the mantle of um, developing hygiene communication, but not just hygiene, communicating hygiene practices, it's communicating understanding of hygiene, 
because self-care depends not just on hygiene understanding, it's on hygiene, sorry, hygiene, knowing hygiene practices, it's on hygiene understanding, hygiene uh, literacy. So for behavior change strategies to be successful, they must be accompanied by education on the basic concepts of targeted hygiene and risk management. It's about breaking the chain of infection at risk moments. Next slide. So if we think about hygiene and come back to the beginning again, hygiene should be part of health care. I believe it must become a part of healthy living strategies alongside healthy diet, healthy exercise and so on. It's something we aspire to. It's not something 20th century. It's about dirt and recommending children. And uh, it, it's, it's something we aspire to as part of healthy living. Next slide. So thank you very much for living, uh, for listening. I hope that you have found something there to stimulate you and, and, and give you food for thought. For those of you who are interested and might need uh, further information, uh, may I suggest uh, you, you visit our IFH website, which contains a whole range of materials, not just scientific reviews, uh, but uh, training and communication materials. What you might find useful is our teaching and self-learning resource, home hygiene training uh, resource produced, which we uh, produce in collaboration with the Infection Prevention Society, and then a range of uh, plain language uh, fact and hygiene advice sheets. So again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Sally, for your um, excellent presentation, very useful. Um, and now we, we move from lessons from COVID-19 and the role of hygiene in preventing spread of infection to the role of the pharmacy team in this infection with Dr. Dalal Amudi. Dr. Dalal Amudi is um, FIP Antimicrobial Resistance Commission member. It's a regional engagement. Uh, it's responsible for the, um, the Western Mediterranean region engagement. It's also FIP Women in Science and Education Steering Committee member. And um, it's also associate team for assessment of Lebanese International University, uh, the School of Pharmacy. Dr. Dalal, thank you very much for your presence here, please. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you and thank you so much Katya for the introduction. I would like also to thank the uh, FIP for inviting me to be with pharmacists here and would like to uh, also thank Reckitt for sponsoring of this self-care event. So after the nice presentation of hygiene and targeted hygiene as done by Professor Bloomfield, we're gonna do a bit of focus into the role of the pharmacy team. Actually, I am a pharmacist in background and uh, also I deeply work in microbiology. So the topic of this infection reflects uh, for me in both terms of pharmacy practice as well as microbiology as well as education because I work in academia. So let us see how can we promote through pharmacist work uh, the use of disinfection as a, as a manner to support self-care in common conditions. Next slide, please. This is a brief agenda of my talk. So I'm, I'm gonna focus first of all on the perspective of self-care in terms of disinfection and how this reflects uh, in the practice of pharmacy. I'm gonna describe disinfection itself as, a def as definition and, and key properties. I'm gonna focus on the role of the pharmacist, whether it be in academia, in hospitals, or in the community in order to promote disinfection. Uh, I'm going to focus also on how disinfection and our thinking about disinfection has changed in the context of the pandemic. And finally, I'm, I'm going to highlight the role of pharmaceutical associations, including the FIP, in promoting disinfection to be done by pharmacists. Next slide, please. So uh, speaking of disinfection in the context of self-care, I will start with cleanliness. Cleanliness itself or decluttering brings a form of self-accomplishment and increases our uh, uh, perceptions of self-confidence. This is if we speak only about cleaning and decluttering. However, if we speak further about disinfection, 
this infection could, could also be important in the perspective of self-care and is really important for a pharmacist. According to studies, pharmacists are among the most trusted professionals and the community pharmacy forms the most accessible source or resource for patients and the community in order to access information and access medications. So actually the pharmacist, especially the community pharmacist, is a very convenient source of advice. And when it comes to hygiene and to disinfection, the pharmacist becomes really a role model for patients and consumers in order to ask about hygiene. So the role of the pharmacists in hand disinfection and surface disinfection forms part of the first line defense, which is necessary and essential for the targeting of common infections such as colds, uh, uh, influenza, as well as currently uh, during the pandemic, so COVID-19. So if we look at the, the role of disinfection and how disinfection is important in self-care, we will find many prospects. So disinfection, in fact, in fact first minimizes our role of exposure, our, our risk of exposure. So it sets community pharmacy and pharmacy staff at lower risk of infections and primarily preserves their own health. It also kills any remaining microbes that can exist on surfaces and therefore it can break the risk of trans uh, break the chain of transmission of infection. Uh, it renders different surfaces free of pathogens. So when we disinfect surfaces, we reduce the number of pathogens necessary to cause an infection and render the different surfaces hygienically clear. And also disinfection is very important for areas that have high touch profile, for example, doorknobs, uh, uh, mobile phones, switches, tables, etc. So taken together, we, we cannot anymore, uh, uh, we cannot more agree on the role of disinfection and the importance of understanding this principle by pharmacists. Next slide, please. Next slide. So if we go into a bit of science, how is disinfection uh, uh, defined? If you go to, uh, to the different definitions, whether by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or by the World Health Organization, disinfection is a principle in which we do a thermal or a chemical process to eliminate many or all pathogenic organisms with the exception of resistant microbes that are called the spores on the surface of inanimate objects. The WHO almost uses the same definition. So, so the two definitions uh, 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 cr uh, crossover, it is the disinfection according to the WHO is the removal of viable microorganisms to a less harmful level, although this process might not inactivate bacterial spores and resistant forms of pathogens such as prions and some resistant viruses. So let us move on to see what are the properties of a disinfectant in the next slide. Actually, disinfection dates back to this old uh, uh, British uh, uh, microbiologist and medical scientist whose name is Joseph Lister and who was the first one to develop disinfection when he used to spray phenolic acid into the surgery wounds of patients. Although the, the uh, uh, process used by Joseph Lister is not used anymore, but it still forms the basis for modern disinfection and antisepsis in which we need to eliminate microbes from viable and also non-viable surfaces. So a disinfectant is a chemical substance which is capable of killing most pathogenic microorganisms under a defined set of conditions of concentration, organic matter, temperature, etc. cetera. Uh, although it might kill most vegetative microbes, uh, disinfectants are not necessarily effective on bacteria spores, which are very resistant forms of bacteria and might not be also effective on prions and some types of viruses such as hepatitis A, for example, which can resist disinfection for a couple of hours. Usually disinfectants are recommended to apply on inanimate surfaces, and this reflects very much on the role of the pharmacist regarding pharmacy counters, regarding uh, beds, doorknobs, uh, uh, surfaces which are surrounding to the patient. We have also an equal uh, uh, type of chemicals which can be applied to, to animate objects or to living surfaces. And in this case, we call it an antiseptic. Let's move on, please, to the next slide. So what are the ideal properties of a disinfectant? We can ideally think that the disinfectant should be safe, non-toxic, and should be effective. To be more focused on the ideal properties and how can the pharmacist choose the ideal disinfectant, let us look at the most important criteria. 
So uh, uh, a, good, a good disinfectant should have broad spectrum. It should be able to kill gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, most viruses and encountered molds in the surrounding. It should be fast acting. So disinfectants are expected to act in a timely manner within a short exposure time to reduce the count of microbes. Also, disinfectants are expected to uh, be stable towards environmental conditions and towards contaminants, towards the presence of organic material, for example, pus, blood, or different body fluids. So a good disinfectant should not be affected by the presence of such organic substances and should retain its efficacy even in their presence. Uh, uh, ideal disinfectants should also be non-toxic at the useful concentrations, so sh they should not cause irritation or side effects to the user. They should be also compatible with surfaces. For example, they should not cause corrosion of metallic articles. They should not cause color changes in cloth or in other material. So the surface, the surface disinfected should by itself remain intact and not be affected by the chemical itself. Disinfectants also, and from a consumer perspective, should be easy to use in the sense that the label of a disinfectant should contain easy and achievable information so that the consumer uses the disinfectant in a correct manner. Disinfectants should be odorless to prevent irritation and to avoid having any residual smells that could be irritating to the user. Disinfectants should be economic, that is, their prices should not be prohibitively high, otherwise uh, they, will, they will not be cost effective. They should be soluble as well in water in order to be able to prepare from them, from them uh, uh, useful dilutions. They should be stable in the used concentration and not affected by dilution. They should be environmentally friendly. And in this sense, they should, as, as uh, Professor Bloomfield mentioned, we should not focus on disinfectant use and uh, uh, be not friendly to the environment. And finally, disinfectants should not leave residues. So on the surface, should not leave excessive residues. However, they should be able to maintain on the surfaces where, where they are used a film of material which prevents contamination for a reasonable period of time. Next slide, please. This being said, what can we say about pharmacists and their use of disinfectants? So uh, whether speaking about community pharmacists, about pharmacists in education, or about pharmacists in hospitals, how can disinfection reflect on pharmacy practice and propose in the, in the notion of self-care. Actually, for a community pharmacist, and because community pharmacy forms a site of very heavy trafficking of patients and very easy contact between the pharmacist, the pharmacy staff, and the, uh, uh, the patients, there should be phar community pharmacists should be able to properly select disinfectants and should be able also to ensure sufficient supply of the different types of disinfectants as well as hand sanitizers. And they should promote hygiene uh, uh, among patients by promoting the correct use of these products which are available at the community pharmacy. Speaking about education and awareness, and this reflects very much on the role of public health pharmacists who advocate for the proper disinfection and the proper use of chemicals. So public health pharmacists should counsel patients on proper use of disinfection. Also, pharmacists who act in academia provide enough didactic and experiential education to pharmacy students on the proper use of disinfection of disinfectants and the proper infection control practices. So this falls in the uh, framework of raising public awareness towards the use of disinfectants and how they can be correctly used to break uh, the risk of transmission of infections. Finally, in hospitals, the hospital pharmacist should serve as an advocate for the health for the therapeutic and control committee or its equivalent to provide guidelines about the proper use of disinfectants. And we think about uh, disinfection in hospital pharmacy as a part of antimicrobial stewardship and the tendency of hospital pharmacists to strive for a zero tolerance towards associated infections in hospitals. Next slide, please. So uh, what is the importance of awareness? So, and how can pharmacists be aware about the different disinfectants and how can they be used? In fact, there are numerous resources uh, that can uh, uh, educate about the proper uh, uh, selection of disinfectants, how to disinfect reusable medical devices, how to disinfect surfaces, how to disinfect uh, uh, closed areas to patients in order to prevent infection. Because we say that the type and the level of the disinfection used, as I will explain in a couple of minutes, 
minutes will depend upon the nature of the item we need to disinfect. Uh, it will depend also on its proximity to patients and to critical surfaces, and will depend also on its intended use. So whenever a chemical uh, uh, disinfectant is selected, we will take into account its use. We have to take into account the patient uh, 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 properties, and we have to also take into account environment. So a properly selected disinfectant should achieve the requirements needed for disinfection and for the environment for the uh, for the surfaces however it should be environmentally friendly and should not pose a serious risk to the surroundings uh, uh, the role of the pharmacists also in awareness about disinfections um, is demonstrated in the ability of pharmacists to provide clearly written policies and procedures and provide them on site for the pharmacy staff as well as for the hospital staff so that the different personnel are aware of the the guidelines for the use of disinfection, disinfectants and can easily and uh, uh, effectively apply them uh, in their usual or routine performance. Next slide, please. Um, uh, this is a, a particularly known scheme, which we call the Spalding uh, scheme or the Spalding classification, in which pharmacists are assisted by a clear guideline on how to select the level of disinfection which is needed for the various equipment and the various instruments. So maybe it would be helpful to read this scheme from the lower parts to the upper parts, where Spalding has, uh, Spalding has classified the level of disinfection into non-critical, and this uh, associates with equipment, instruments, and surfaces that do not come into contact with open patient uh, uh, wounds or only do touch the intact skin. So here the level of disinfection is uh, medium, and we, we speak about these as non-critical surfaces. However, if we move upwards, we find that the level of critical surfaces will increase. We move then to the semi-critical surfaces in which we need to use stronger disinfectants with broader spectrum of action and with ability to act on somehow resistant microbes because these uh, uh, items, which are considered to be semi-critical, might come in contact with mucous membranes or might be intended to penetrate into them. Finally, the highest level of disinfection is which shows in the uppermost part of the figure in the pink box is regarded as critical where equipment and instruments will penetrate a sterile tissue and therefore here disinfection alone will not be enough but rather we need to use sterilization. In fact, although the Spalding uh, uh, scheme might still be useful and is very helpful for pharmacists to select the level of the disinfection, and this will be very nicely elaborated in the next slide by my colleague Murphy. However, I just need to say that the borders between non-critical, semi-critical, and critical might sometimes not be uh, might sometimes be hazy or not really clear. Uh, in fact, the emergence of uh, uh, certain uh, um, uh, infected agents that are really resistant, for example, prions, or the emergence of carbapenem uh, uh, resistant gram-negative pathogens, as well as spore former uh, uh, strains of cholestidium difficile might have altered how we think about non-critical, semi-critical, or critical. So in fact, the Spalding scheme should be tailored to fit the conditions in which we are going to use it. However, it's still, of course, would be a very useful guideline for pharmacists to select the type of chemicals and the level of disinfection. Next slide, please. We move on now to uh, how disinfection has changed or how, how our thinking of disinfection in terms of pharmacy and self-care has changed in the context of COVID-19. There is no doubt that COVID-19 has affected every area of life and the unprecedented changes and challenges were very uh, tough and very stressful on the healthcare system and the healthcare system was struggling to adapt itself for the pandemic and to help infected patients and also to stop as much as possible possible the spread of the infection. And with this being said, we see that we, we have noticed that pharmacists as frontliners uh, were really involved in the mitigation of, uh, of COVID-19. And this has obliged some governments and authoritative bodies to impose or to, to, to give a greater authority for pharmacists. So in addition to the traditional roles of, of disinfectant knowledge, disinfectant use, disinfectant awareness, uh, some guidelines have also authorized pharmacists to prepare in their community pharmacy uh, uh, hand sanitizers and disinfectants in order to keep such products available to the public. Next slide, please. 
So, so in the context of COVID-19, this infection becomes one of the cornerstones of the concept of pharmaceutical which has uh, undergone updates in the context of the pandemic. So, so we can see here the main uh, uh, guidelines for the concept of pharmaceutical care that has emerged with COVID-19. These include the adequate supply of drugs and preventive products to patients, including personal protective equipment, hand gels, etc., as well as medications. Pharmacists were also asked to provide sufficient training for staff, be it training for the handling of patient issues or for uh, maintenance of disinfection and hygiene. Uh, pharmacists were also asked to provide enough dispensing for dispensing of medications for patients, to provide referral, to provide consultations, uh, especially uh, in patients who have chronic underlying conditions and who happen to be infected with COVID-19. And also uh, in some instances, pharmacists were asked to provide home care guidance and psychological support as well to patients. All of this comes within the concept that pharmacists should still adhere to the environmental regulations and should adapt pharmaceutical care to the new needs which have been approved by authorities, such as the preparation and the supply of disinfectants. And this in itself contributes to the overall preparedness uh, uh, for the pandemic in which pharmacists have, been, have played a great role. Next slide, please. So if we think about hospital pharmacists, hospital pharmacists were responsible during the pandemic to adhere to the different regulations for infection control and prevention. And this continues to happen and to be uh, uh, important uh, with uh, expected perhaps uh, additional waves or additional, uh, uh, additional or progression of the pandemic and also with expectations if they, if they might exist of any new variants of the virus. So the principles of disinfection and sterilization in a hospital pharmacy should still, uh, uh, sh maybe, maybe we should learn or we should build on the learnings which we have had during the COVID-19 in order to protect the premises of the hospital, the patients and the staff from infection. Here, the communication of the pharmacist is very important. Commands and the communication documents written by pharmacists for the whole hospital uh, staff could be very important and should be communicated to the uh, uh, stakeholders and to the involved parties in a timely and effective manner in order to update uh, any requirements of disinfection. Next slide, please. So in the context of hospital care uh, with COVID-19 and with disinfection in general, the pharmacy team should play a multidisciplinary approach in which collaborative efforts between pharmacists, this includes the leaders or the head of the pharmacy staff, the staff pharmacists and the, uh, other uh, pharmacy technicians as well. All these should communicate with infectious disease specialists, with respiratory care practitioners and with the microbiology laboratory in order to improve the outcomes and in, in order to help for maintenance of uh, a proper uh, means of disinfection throughout the pandemic and also later on. Next slide, please. So actually, uh, elaborated guidelines from pharmaceutical associations have aimed at keeping pharmacists and patients protected uh, against, in, uh, against harmful uh, microbes, especially in the context of COVID-19. So uh, interested pharmacists may seek to look at the guidance uh, summary, which was issued by the FIP at the beginning of the pandemic, and which indicates how COVID-19 uh, can be uh, eliminated through the process of disinfection, where you can see what are the different manners what are the different disinfective agents and what are the different chemicals that can be used and also uh, the hand and the surface disinfection. Likewise, the, the uh, American Pharmaceutical Association has also posted key guidelines for cleaning and disinfection, uh, which can be easily applied in the community pharmacy. These guidelines have been also further elaborated, especially by the FIP, as we can see in the next slide. So in addition to the uh, original summary guidance, the FIP has also elaborated a health advisory guideline for pharmacists and the pharmacy workforce with a specific section about cleaning and disinfection management, and which has summarized findings from studies and the most important key uh, measures which can be used by pharmacists to minimize the spread of uh, uh, coronavirus during the pandemic. I will finish with the last slide. So uh, uh, I'd like to uh, finish this talk with a, with a, a, a good, on a good message or a good uh, uh, takeaway. Uh, also, uh, 
uh, inspired by the work of Lister. So this slide shows you the carbolic acid, carbolic acid spray, sprayer, which Lister have used uh, to uh, spray his hands and then to spray the rooms where he used to perform surgery in order to disinfect these rooms. And actually, uh, uh, when Lister started to use this procedure routinely, he noticed that the survival rates in his patients significantly increased. So moving on from this to all the modern uh, uh, methods of disinfection, we should always say that disinfection is one of the key aspects of pharmacy practice, is one of the key aspects of self-care, and should be always reinforced by pharmacists. By this, I finish, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dawal, for your presentation. And uh, now uh, we move to uh, Dr. Murphy. Um, Dr. Murphy is a member of uh, F um, FIP Commission on Antimicrobial Resistance. It's also director of REACT, Action for Antibiotics Resistance from Africa. And he's also a partnership and stakeholder engagement lead for the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions. And um, he will talk about the appropriate choice and use of disinfectants. Dr. Murphy, please, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, Katya and I appreciate FIP for giving me this opportunity of just sharing some reflections uh, on the appropriate choice and use of disinfectants. Uh, I think it comes, I think one of the things that COVID-19 has done, it has brought a spotlight on antimicrobial resistance and uh, also brought a spotlight on the importance and uh, the criticalness of being prepared for infectious diseases, uh, uh, both in terms of prevention, in terms of treatment, and in terms of the way that, um, you know, uh, the role of the pharmacist uh, in terms of, um, you know, the critical role in terms of infection prevention and control. You know, at the rate that we um, are losing critical antibiotics um, uh, because the pipeline has been dry, uh, but also that, you know, there's, um, uh, we've lost so many to, you know, uh, drug resistant pathogens. It's very critical that, you know, uh, we look at, at ways in which our health facilities, uh, the contribution of the pharmacist, uh, you know, uh, in hospitals, in communities, uh, can actually influence uh, this sort of, um, um, you know, uh, creating a disruption in the chain of infections. Uh, quickly, my objectives are to just go briefly with the definitions that have been handled already. I'll look at, I mean, how do we choose an appropriate, actually, chemical disinfectant to use? Then, uh, 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 basically, I'll end on the use of the, uh, um, uh, what, uh, disinfectants uh, uh, themselves. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so there is always um, a bit of confusion, even among us as pharmacists and professionals, in terms of uh, really what is disinfection, sterilization, and cleaning. These most times are actually used interchangeably when we mean uh, either uh, the sterilization or disinfection or cleaning. A sterilization has been defined earlier as a process that uh, basically uh, destroys or eliminates all forms of microbial life and is carried out in healthcare facilities uh, uh, by physical or a chemical uh, method. Uh, disinfection describes a process that eliminates many or all pathogenic uh, uh, microorganisms with the caveat that, you know, you know, uh, they do not do that for, uh, for bacterial spores on inanimate objects and uses chemical agents or heat to reduce the number of viable uh, organisms. I think that is quite critical. Next slide. Um, and so really cleaning uh, is often used and normally cleaning what we are referring to is a general removal of date of food, blood or saliva or other uh, uh, body secretions. It can be done, it can be done using a detergent and hot water. And I mean, cleaning is a prerequisite for both, uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, basically, uh, what, uh, disinfection and the sterilization. But we also have active sanitization that we now use a lot. And because of the hand washers and the alcohol wraps that we have now, uh, there's always that confusion. This is a process of reducing the number of germs to a safe level and can be done by either cleaning or uh, disinfecting or both. 
there's a common term that we use in hospital facilities and that's uh, uh, decontamination. I think at the height of COVID, uh, we saw the ICUs and other units where we saw, you know, uh, these health professionals that are actually uh, masked and they're using the PPEs and, you know, uh, they are like, they are, are really in a war zone and uh, are doing decon. It is a sequence of procedures for removing or, ki uh, or killing pathogenic microorganisms from objects so that they are safe to handle, use or discard. It can include any, or all, all of the following, it can include cleaning, uh, basically uh, a disinfection and sterilization, both, both actually can be used under a decon, pro you know, uh, so it's a procedure of sequences, in other words. Next slide. We are very concerned about uh, disinfection. Why are we concerned? Are we very concerned because of pathogens of concern? And these pathogens are, are cause a lot of diseases. And some of these diseases, we are finding them hard to treat. If one looks at tuberculosis, for example, you know, uh, one looks at uh, even just, uh, you know, uh, simple UTIs, RTIs, they are becoming difficult to treat because of the rise in drug resistance. And uh, the pathogens that we are concerned about with uh, uh, this process of disinfection uh, include, uh, uh, they include viruses, uh, blood uh, borne, for example, hepatitis B, HIV, rotavirus, uh, that causes a lot of diarrheal uh, diseases. And uh, uh, we have more children dying in low and middle income countries today uh, uh, because of really the contamination that's there. Also HPV is one of them, the coronavirus as we have it, and this is on pandemic uh, uh, influenza virus. Uh, there's also, you know, uh, we are concerned about the fungi, yeast and the molds, but we equally really concerned about some of these pathogens that, you know, uh, really the World Health Organization has classified as the critically important uh, are really pathogens, and these, uh, these include E. coli, for example, you know, you know, uh, Reclepsiella and actually MESA, you know, uh, but also there are parasites that are concerned about and also prions uh, like CJD. Next slide. So what are the methods of uh, uh, disinfection that we can use? Uh, one, we can use heat as a method of uh, uh, disinfection and uh, uh, the chemical uh, methods also. Uh, so thermal, uh, when one looks at thermal uh, disinfection, it relies on moist heat I mean, to kill bacteria or, uh, or viruses really by exposing them to a specific temperature for a, for a set uh, say, amount of time. And it's got the ability of destroying the protein. And so uh, it affects the protein synthesis uh, um, of the pathogen. Uh, but when you're using heat, I mean, there's some advantages to that because um, uh, uh, you can heat that can actually uh, destroy uh, uh, those products that cannot be uh, really compatible uh, in terms of actually uh, uh, moist. And, uh, you know, there are some uh, disadvantages that are key, are key to look at. I mean, we'll talk about the kill rate. We'll talk about actually time that it takes. Uh, for most of these procedures, you're looking at, for example, if you're going to use a um, uh, really thermal heat, I'm mean, looking at uh, uh, being in between at least 340 uh, degrees Fahrenheit or 170 uh, degrees in centigrade, and uh, that will take about an hour or so. Or you're looking at 160 uh, degrees, and that's about uh, that's 120 uh, degrees. Or, or increase increase the temperature, uh, lower the temperature to 300 uh, uh, degrees and uh, uh, really focus at about 150 minutes or so. Uh, when we talk about the chemical uh, disinfection process, um, it's, it's really categorically in three levels. And we do have the high level of uh, um, uh, disinfection and this, uh, uh, we can use acuparacetic acid, for example, we can use a chlorine, uh, uh, base products like I'm um, hypochlorite, uh, those are low to high level. And the intermediate uh, uh, level, we normally would use really phenolics uh, for high touch contaminated surfaces. And the low level uh, disinfection, uh, we typically would focus on using the quaternary ammonium compounds. But I mean, key to really is that, you know, uh, we have to have an exposure time that is actually sufficient to be able to uh, destroy or uh, disrupt, uh, you know, uh, uh, the bacteria or the pathogens, uh, you know, 
uh, metabolism or you know a uh, uh, basic protein synthesis or you know uh, the cell uh, itself in the process of uh, uh, disinfection it is a decontamination process that eliminates most pathogenic micro uh, the microorganisms, but it does not do that for spores. And I think that's quite um, critical for us to, uh, uh, to not. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so for high level uh, disinfection, you know, uh, this is a procedure or process that kills vegetative microorganisms and inactive viruses. Uh, uh, but important to note is that it does not necessarily, you know, you know, uh, in high numbers of bacterial spores are actually are destroyed and such disinfectants are capable uh, to, um, to end in sterilization when the contact time is, is long enough, probably six to 10 hours as an example. Um, and as high level uh, disinfectants, they are used for a relatively short time, about 10 to 30 minutes. These are chemicals uh, that are called uh, uh, gemicides and have the potential, uh, you know, um, to, uh, basically to act against the sporicides and in the US, uh, these are classified under the FDA as really sterile and or a uh, disinfectant. For intermediate uh, uh, level uh, disinfection, uh, we're looking at a procedure that kills the vegetative microorganisms, including mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, which is a huge, a huge problem in most low and middle income countries currently. And a low level disinfectant, you know, uh, it does kill most of the vegetative uh, bacteria except Mycobacterium um, uh, TB and fungi, and it inactivates only some of the viruses. When one looks at the uh, uh, next slide, so these are some of the examples, and this is important for us as pharmacists, because we play a critical role as has been highlighted in the last two presentations uh, uh, in the sense of providing, uh, you know, uh, this sort of um, uh, guidance on what on what products, on what chemicals are going to be used. And uh, uh, we should realize that, I mean, each one of these, uh, they will have characteristics in terms of the way that they act, in terms of the activity range, how to use them, are the advantages and some of the uh, disadvantages. For example, uh, let's look at actually formalin. Um, it's a high level disinfectant. Uh, it inactivates microorganisms by uh, the process of actually alkylation of the amino acid and the sulfahydro uh, groups of proteins and ring nitrogen atoms of the purine bases. And its activity, it is bactericidal and it will work, it will work against the TB uh, bacteria, it is a fungicidal, it's virucidal, and also and sporocidal at various concentrations. Its uses is limited um, as really a chemidestrant. Uh, sometimes it's used uh, to process hemodialyzers and also actually gaseous form is used to uh, decontaminate a uh, uh, laboratory safety cabinets. It is active as an advantage in the presence of organic materials. But unfortunately, it is carcinogenic, it is toxic, it is strong and irritant, and has a pageant uh, uh, order. Uh, next slide. Uh, the next slide uh, shows us some examples um, uh, of the middle level uh, disinfectants, actually intermediate level disinfectants. And uh, you know, uh, here we've got alcohols as an example. You know, uh, uh, the advantages that they have is that uh, uh, they are actually fast acting, no residue actually staining uh, is left. And again, the disadvantage is that you know these evaporate very fast. They're actually volatile, and they may harden. Uh, they may harden rubber or cause a deterioration of glues and intoxication. And uh, we see with iodine, for example, and iodophore um, uh, disinfectants, they are very rapid in acting. So they do have that advantage. You know, and they've got also a broader spectrum in the sense that actually they're bactericidal and sporicidal and viricidal and fungicidal, but again, uh, you know, uh, they are not suitable for most of the hard surfaces and they are also really corrosive. And so, you know, we have to look at what we are trying to uh, really uh, uh, disinfect and get the right and the best disinfectant that we can use. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. 
low level disinfectants, we've got examples of the phenolic disinfectants, you know, uh, uh, these again, they've got an advantage that, you know, uh, they'll act against bacteria, you know, you know, a gram positive bacteria and uh, uh, they can act against the envelope of viruses, you know, that's another advantage. Yeah. And uh, that's the row of activities, you know, uh, they leave a residual film on environmental surfaces, you know, uh, that might prolong uh, their activity, but it might also mean that, you know, uh, we can be exposed, you know, uh, um, to some toxic uh, uh, levels. And of course, you know, uh, there's been some argument which, which was uh, uh, which was mentioned earlier on that you know uh, if we leave the disinfectants are uh, uh, long enough in low concentration uh, uh, they can contribute to antimicrobial resistance but there isn't any sufficient evidence for that argument you know um, it's not been uh, really well uh, uh, basically well supported then I mean the quaternion ammonium compounds are um, are uh, also, you know, uh, these are effective against such a gram positive and gram negative bacteria um, in terms of way that they act and the advantage, these are non irritating to hands. And usually, you know, uh, they have also, you know, uh, uh, these detergent actually properties. Next slide. So the question actually arises, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Spalding actually classification is one of the ones I'm spoiling um, believed that uh, uh, the nature uh, the nature of disinfection could be understood readily if instruments and items for actually patient care were uh, uh, best categorized as either critical or semi-critical and non-critical according to the degree of risk infection involved in the use of the items. And so the spotting classification is the one that we typically uh, use. And so this one looks at, you know, uh, uh, read the classification scheme replaces uh, these uh, uh, reusable medical instruments or devices into three categories of ascending risk or infection. Um, the lowest actually items are termed non-critical and these include as patient care equipment like the blood pressure cuffs and wheelchairs. And then uh, the next level uh, of risk really includes uh, that contact uh, uh, mucus uh, uh, membranes and you know uh, the GI and the genital uh, 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 um, urinary tract or non-intact skin. These uh, non-sterile parts of the body can actually tolerate uh, uh, being exposed to low numbers of bacterial spores without developing an infection. And devices in this category are termed really semi-critical and include uh, you know, uh, those instruments like the bronchoscopes and the endoscopes. Then when we look at the, you know, uh, the critical, uh, uh, critical uh, levels, uh, of disinfection of the medical devices, uh, uh, we're looking at those instruments that enter the sterile body, body cavities or the vascular system that comprises the third and the highest risk. And so uh, here the risk is really high. And so uh, the level of decontamination is determined by you know, uh, this level of uh, a risk for infection, but the way that these instruments are, are gonna be used. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so for chemical disinfectants, uh, which we typically use and are going to recommend, you know, uh, these are classified really generically and uh, their uh, biocidal capabilities actually vary. You know, uh, we've got examples here that I've given of actually ethanol, isopropyl alcohol, you know, uh, and non enveloped viruses um, such as the coxy uh viruses and rotavirus or polyvirus uh, 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 that can survive for actually extended period of time that has to be actually considered in terms of the time we expose those particular surfaces to uh then of course the quaternion ammonium uh, these are effective against bacteria but only and somewhat effective against fungi and viruses i think we looked at that in terms of uh, uh really us being able to consider uh, the added advantage or what we are trying or the organisms that we suspect are going to be on the surfaces that we would like to uh, actually uh, uh, basically disinfect. Uh, uh, next slide. So how do we choose uh, how do we choose an appropriate disinfectant? This is critical, you know, uh, because that's the role now where you know uh, we come in and get involved. I know in the northern countries, the pharmacists are really involved, uh, you know, 
uh, in this process and actually advising in policy development, uh, but also in the aspect of actually guiding the hospital team in this process. In low and middle income countries, uh, uh, we don't find that the pharmacists are very much involved uh, uh, in this area, but you know, uh, uh, it's an area where you know um, it's high time if we are not involved we get involved in a hospital setting or any healthcare setting or the community setting itself and so at uh, number one we're trying to look at actually efficacy efficacy is critical uh, we have to choose a disinfectant that works against the microorganisms we are targeting so it means that we have to have some idea of of the possible you know uh you know um these possible pathogens that we are looking at uh, secondly, the concentration of the disinfectant is, is critical uh, because we have to use the correct concentration. Otherwise, you know, uh, we may not be able to actually destroy those pathogens that we are targeting. Uh, the contact time is important, you know, and, and this, you know, uh, that sort of actually the kill time is very important because we have to again expose them to an adequate time that will destroy them or inhibit uh, uh, their growth. Uh, the shelf life is important because, you know, uh, many disinfectants are going to be uh, diluted. And once diluted, again, they are the role of the pharmacist to show that, you know, the, uh, we have to put a label, you know, do not use after this period of time uh, because we are considering the shelf life um, as they lose activities uh, uh, um, if we keep them actually for a longer time. Uh, the other one that we have to consider, you know, uh, is the presence of contaminants. Uh, this could be proteins, organic matter. This would slow down the activity of the disinfectant that we want to use. And so, you know, uh, it's critical that we do the cleaning we talked about earlier on before really we get into uh, 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 this process of, uh, uh, um, of using the disinfectant. Uh, next slide. Uh, some other factors include, you know, we've got to consider the pH and the temperature uh, because most of it's, uh, most of the chemicals that we're going to use have an optimal pH they will act on and the temperature for efficacy. And so if the temperature is low enough, we will not achieve that critical kill that we want. If the time is not there, we will not be able to achieve um, the critical actual kill time that is uh, desired. Uh, we need to make a consideration of the water that we have. Um, the hardness of water can reduce the rate of kill of certain uh, uh, disinfectants. And again, compatibility is critical. What instruments, uh, what surfaces are we trying to uh, really disinfect? And so that uh, we choose the correct disinfectant. But again, being very considerate uh, of the health hazards that these are chemicals and they can be hazardous by nature. And so we have to consider that aspect also. Right? So, so with chemical, you know, so yeah, what is an ideal disinfectant? You know, what are the properties that uh, we really are looking for? Well, an ideal disinfectant, you know, must ideally have a broad spectrum of activities. You know, if it can target both a gram negative and gram positive, that's great. If you can target, I mean, fungi or viruses, that is great. But we also have to select something that is fast acting so that, you know, uh, we don't expose those equipment or we don't expose, you know, the, uh, those surfaces for a very long time. They have to be easy to use. Uh, they should be orderless, economical, not taking so much cost. They should be compatible with the surface, non-corrosive, ideally soluble in water and stable, and they should be environmentally actually friendly. But they should also have a residual effect. And you know, they should not only kill microorganisms, but you know, uh, they also have a residual effect, which means that they remain active in water after disinfection. And so that is quite uh, uh, critical. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, just two weeks ago, I was um, uh, in one country in West Africa, and I was making a prison, you know, uh, basically training uh, doctors, nurses, and pharmacists. Uh, uh, on antimicrobial stewardship, and we are uh, doing a point prevalence uh, a study, and uh, we visited one of the hospitals, and I was asking, um, you know, uh, uh, these surgeons, GPs, and the pharmacists, I said, you know, uh, so how, you know, uh, let's look at the surgical prophylaxis in this institution, how is it done? And they said, oh, you know, uh, we bring in patients three days before, and so we start pumping them with, you know, all these antibiotics, and I said to them, wow, that sounds very strange because, uh, because I mean, recommended guidelines 
uh, that you give them the first dose of your surgical prophylaxis uh, within an hour of the surgery. And so they said, no, 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 no. We don't do that. So I said, why? They said, no, we don't trust really our instruments are disinfected, they are sterilized. And so we keep the patients, three days we bring them into the hospital, have the procedure done, then we keep them for five days. And then we actually discharge them on another five days of treatment. And, you know, so this is, you know, and these are surgeons. And I'm going, this is a very strange practice, but, you know, you know, so it's really critical that, you know, these instruments, you know, those using them are very comfortable and, you know, they believe in the process that was done. Uh, so the process, uh, uh, there are two processes that one can look at, you know, uh, it's either a one-step process or a two-step process. And, you know, uh, these, um, we, uh, we look at really uh, this disinfectant solution at a dilution level of about a thousand parts per million available chloroquine, and we can use a one step there, uh, but we can also use a, a two step actually procedure. I'll do that on the next slide. And what is important here is that uh, where we've got the safety data sheet, we should be able to use that and really consider the critical, uh, those critical elements I mentioned earlier, concentration, contact and temperature, and the pH as critical. Next slide. So we can use actually a decision tree and decide which pathway. You know, is it a one-step process, just a disinfection process, or we need to do the cleaning and then disinfect? Uh, in the interest of time, uh, these are the questions that I would be asking, you know, you know, a residue, uh, may affect the uh, disinfectant efficacy. If it is yes, then we follow that pathway. Um, how much is the amount of residue on the, you know, at uh, that surface that we are trying to clean? Is it high? If the answer is yes, then we do that. That's a pathway. Are uh, we continue following that? Is the disinfectant that's a formulation effective uh, uh, cleaner? If the answer is no, then really we know that there it has to be a two-step process because we will not achieve the aim or the goal that we are trying to achieve for uh, uh, disinfection. But otherwise, if not, then it will be a one-step process. We go ahead with the use uh, of the disinfectants, uh, you know, as as recommended. And so a decision tree can be something that can be very helpful in making uh, you know, that decision, just following the pathway, we can, we, can, we can make a determination whether we need a two step or just a one step. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So the chemical disinfectants, uh, you know, being a process, we've got to look at some of the factors uh, that affect the efficacy of disinfection. You know, uh, the prior cleaning of the object, uh, this is critical. You know, if there are objects, object like we saw on the last uh, on the last slide, you know, uh, using you know uh, that decision tree pathway, we can determine if we need to clean before we disinfect. You know, um, if they've got so much organic matter, we we supposed to actually. Uh, uh, do that. If it's the, you know, uh, these instruments that are going to uh, be used, uh, you know, um, in sterile, in sterile, uh, in sterile, in sterile uh, cavities, then of course they need to be cleaned first and then we disinfect, you know. Uh, we've got to look at uh, the resistance patterns uh, if we have that, you know, and also look at the concentration and the potency of the disinfectants. Yeah, uh, we talk about the contact time, very critical. The physical and chemical and chemical factors are, are really key. Again, temperature, pH, um, uh, humidity, water hardness, that is important. And the presence of uh, real organic and inorganic matter, that's critical. And the biofilms, uh, uh, that might remain afterwards because uh, that actually might cause uh, uh, um, some uh, uh, desired effect on the skin. Uh, next slide. So how do we use the chemical uh, disinfectants? Uh, uh, critical. If we've got uh, you know, uh, that safety data sheet, it's critical that uh, uh, we look at it and we select uh, the right disinfectants and so that we can actually uh, really assure, assure uh, the result that you know, a repost disinfection, this particular instrument or surface uh, has very minimal or zero of the, you know, uh, uh, those pathogens of interest. Uh, we have to carry out a chemical risk assessment of the, uh, the disinfectant that we're going to use and implement appropriate control measures to ensure safe use. And so we have to be vested and look at that analysis and present it. Again, we have to follow the manufacturer's instructions to ensure the correct use 
and, and in Cali, whether it's our patients, our communities, our hospitals, that, that, that is being followed. When we don't have a policy, if we have a policy, let's use that policy in place. If we don't, it's time for us to look at this area and actually develop a policy in our institutions. Again, we have to continue training and instructing our employees on the correct and safe use and handling of uh, disinfectants. And uh, 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 normally housekeeping and, you know, and, and the engineering department are left out of this process so many times uh, um, in our health institutions. They have to be considered in that uh, we train them and ensure our, uh, uh, that, I mean, they understand the risks that are involved and the selection and that really they are involved in this process. But also we've got to really consider uh, the rotational use of the disinfectants um, to prevent any form of resistance that may uh, develop as an undesirable uh, effect. Next slide. So ensure adequate ventilation. If you're gonna be using something that is caustic or really something that is gonna, is gonna, is gonna you know, uh, produce any fumes uh, because inhalation can cause some uh, uh, respiratory, you know, uh, irritation uh, that is not actually desired, and so uh, we need to take that into consideration. And we should, uh, we should take into consideration that you know, uh, disinfectants should not be mixed with other chemicals uh, that can be hazardous. You know, uh, if we take really sodium hypochlorite, for example, bleach, and we add, uh, we add acids, I mean vinegar, it will create I mean chlorine uh, uh, gas, which is toxic. But also, we have to avoid the contact with the skin and eyes as these may be irritated. And of course, inhalation is not something that we want. It can actually precipitate an asthmatic attack, and that's not what we desire. Next slide. So we need to be cautious. Avoid using the uh, disinfectants uh, near an open flame due to the flammability uh, of alcohol. Use gloves. That is critical, and so that you know, uh, we clean the surfaces. Our skin is not getting in contact with the surfaces, and of course, you know, uh, we should use really single-use uh, disposable cleaning equipment um, if we have them in place. Uh, disposable towels. I know that you know uh, some of these are high aspirations uh, uh, in low and middle-income countries. I visit so many countries and so many health institutions uh, um, in the African regions, and I see so many challenges every day: lack of gloves, you know, no equipment, you know, no running water. Those are those are a reality that's there. But you know, uh, we still have to find a way in which we can work uh, within those particular challenges. Uh, next slide. Hand sanitizers, just very briefly, it's a misnomer, you know, uh, because, you know, uh, um, it's finding a, a, a gems, but the ingredient is actually alcohol, which is um, indeed a disinfectant. And uh, uh, we've seen, as mentioned earlier on, I think in the COVID era, we've seen, I mean, some of the health institutions have been capacitated, you know, uh, to actually, you know, uh, manufacture hand sanitizers in the health institutions. And, uh, you know, and uh, uh, the issues of quality come in place, the issues of assuring that, you know, uh, uh, these are not harming the skin and really causing irritation, you know, and uh, um, uh, there have been so many myths. No, don't overuse, you know, uh, don't overuse these chemicals. Um, they can be carcinogenic and all that, but, you know, it's, uh, it, uh, we need to ensure that we are providing you know, basically scientific evidence assuring the quality and assuring that, you know, these are actually available and they're being used, uh, you know, um, in the right way. Next slide. So this was dealt with, I think, in terms of really uh, what is the role of the pharmacist. But I mean, uh, needless to say that, you know, there has been a spotlight on our profession and there's been a spotlight, you know, uh, with the way that actually healthcare has changed, uh, especially in most of the low and middle income countries where a, a pharmacy has become, has become the first point of care for patients, you know, uh, they go to a pharmacist, a pharmacy place, you know, uh, to get their advice, I mean, to be able to, uh, to procure, you know, uh, uh, antibiotics or any form of medicines. And uh, in low and middle income countries, most, you know, I can speak uh, in our region, African region is that, you know, uh, you can walk into any, you know, uh, most countries, you can walk into any drugstore and buy any antibiotic that you can buy. 
So there is a critical role where you know uh, we play as pharmacists, and you know I uh, should be able to use that, but also just practice our own infection prevention uh, and control. In some countries, tablets are still being counted by hand. They don't have any counting trays. You know, in the West, it's different. I worked in the US for many years. You know, uh, we never did that. You know, it's not done, but you know, uh, um, uh, you come to Africa, Asia, Latin America, you know, uh, it's it, it done. And so ensuring that, you know, uh, we are not cross-contaminating, you know, uh, washing of hands, as was said earlier on, you know, uh, using, you know, uh, these processes uh, uh, that assure and prevent infection, that's the only way that, you know, uh, we can break the cycle of infection. Uh, next slide. So lastly, really, disinfection is an effective measure my colleagues to actually disrupt the chain of infections, reduce the burden of infectious diseases, the need for antibiotics and slows down antimicrobial resistance. We are losing too many lives uh, uh, from, you know, uh, you know, uh, non, you know, you know, uh, these drug resistance pathogens that, you know, uh, we just can treat. And so it's important for us to, you know, uh, really educate our hospitals, our facilities, our facilities actually, you know, uh, and our communities, because this infection, uh, this infection prevention and control must actually go into the communities that we live and serve in. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Murphy, for this uh, relevant um, lecture. And now uh, we want to 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 open if you if FIP allows only two or three questions. Um, I, I would like to to thank to the participants the, the active uh, participation with a lot of questions. And um, here we have uh, relevant questions about the interplay between antimicrobial resistance and the use of disinfectants. So I will ask to Professor Sally um, if uh, there is evidence on cross resistance between disinfectants and antibiotics, and related with this, the the last question that is about the rotation use for disinfection, because um, it's it's important to clarify if you should use the rotation of disinfection and the motives why you use it, Professor Sally, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just giving me the opportunity to say a little more because I didn't cover it very well in, in my presentation, but I think I can say sort of two things. If you take microbes, put them in a test tube and expose them to any stress, including stress of low level biocides, they will develop reduced susceptibility to antibiotics and they will reduce, they will develop reduced susceptibility to biocides. It's, you know, that's what that's what cells do. If you stress them, they will they will react and, and protect themselves. So this person who asked about um, uh, rotating biocides, disinfectants, is correct because that is a reversible process. And if you stop using that disinfectant, then there is the reduced susceptibility to the disinfectant will will recede. Uh, so by switching disinfectants and moving forward, you can retain sensitivity to a disinfectant. When we're talking about antibiotic resistance, we're not talking about reduced susceptibility. We're talking about clinically stable resistance. And there is good evidence. Again, uh, it's, it's from um, mostly from laboratory experiments that some types of biocides can select for genetically stable um, reduce susceptibility to antibiotics, and that can be sufficient uh, if you look at the, you know, at the the data to say, well, I would expect that that could be clinically resi resistant. Um, but have, that having been said, we have never seen any good evidence in vi in vivo that prolonged use of biocides in our homes or in a hospital can produce stable resistance to antibiotics. Does that sound you're, you're more of um, you're more of an expert than I am on this? Would you agree with me, Katia? Yes, I agree with you completely. Uh, I think that uh, it's it's emerging genes 
uh, that uh, in, in vitro can induce that uh, that idea, but in vivo it's not proven. I completely agree. Thank you for for your your answer. I would like to to ask to Dr. Dalal. Um, she said in very well that the community pharmacists uh, have a, a critical role on the public uh, communication. Uh, and to, to transmit a clear and efficient messages. And uh, we have one question that is, how can we explain the balance between uh, the, the concepts that are uh, apparently opposite? Too clean for your own good, or we need exposure uh, to keep our immune system? And some, some participants, including uh, speak about the soil and the connection of the kids with the soil. Can we? How can we explain this efficiency? Thank you, Katya, and thanks for the question. Actually, the ex uh, the exposure, as mentioned before in the in the talk, exposure to pathogens strengthens our immunity. And so it is. It is the it is this, the, the better the exposure or the more the exposure, the more we build defense against pathogens. And that's why exposure to the soil or to dirt as the question, as the text of the question mentioned, might expose us to additional pathogens and might strengthen our immunity. So I think I'd rather say the key to this is to make a balance. We would rather uh, uh, avoid excessive uh, uh, um, and uh, unmonitored or um, un or irrational exposure, uh, but we'd rather do uh, uh, the regular and the routine cleaning and, if needed, the disinfection. So I guess the idea is in the balance or in the equilibrium between what we are exposed to and what would she what would we recognize or perceive as harmful in order to use cleaning and disinfection. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, a question to, to Dr. Uh, Murphy that is um, a difficult one. What is the best antiviral disinfectant? I think that it's <laughs> the question for one million, no? Uh, we are without uh, sound, Dr. Murphy. Yeah. Uh, this was interesting. I mean, I, I made a presentation while standing because of my internet where I am is so bad. I had to find a spot where, where really I had internet. But, you know, uh, needless to say, that's a very difficult question that you, um, uh, you pose. Uh, but uh, as you saw earlier on in, uh, in some slides that I showed uh, uh, when I looked at the, you know, uh, those slides on the high-level disinfectant, the intermediate and the low level, uh, we had some chemicals that are active against, uh, against viruses, you know, uh, like for instance, uh, uh, glutaraldehyde uh, uh, was shown to be you know, uh, very effective against, against uh, basically viruses. Uh, uh, we had other ones that included, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, that included uh, non-enveloped uh, uh, viruses. You can use hydrogen peroxide. And so, you know, uh, the point really here is, uh, you know, uh, to look at the particular, the particular, the particular really environment that you are trying to either decontaminate or sterilize. Yeah, you know, uh, um, or, uh, uh, disinfect, I'm sorry. And then, and then look at the properties uh, of the disinfectants that either you have available or you are trying to procure and so that you can use the correct one. It, it really would depend and very dependent on, uh, uh, on the surface as well. You're gonna use uh, you know, uh, one of these actually uh, chemicals. So you know, it's, um, it's a judgment call that you're going to make. Uh, uh, um, but I also wanted to, um, uh, to quickly weigh Brief, in. The briefly, because yeah, we have briefly, to finish, yeah. please. Yeah. Yes, the concern should not be about really antimicrobial resistance uh, in terms of uh, you know, not using. You know, it should be about us really selecting the right one and actually weighing that and drawing that balance that actually Tala had mentioned earlier on. I think that is quite critical. But also, you know, uh, we've got to be uh, to understand that, you know, uh, there is actually the movement in genomics of resistance uh, at genes, you know, uh, from actually pathogens in human, in animals, in the environment. And that's quite critical as part of this conversation. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much. We have to finish. Um, I would like to sincerely thank to our panelists for their excellent contributions. Um, as uh, uh, has been written, the, um, the recording of this, uh, this session will be available on FIP website. And we are uh, great to, to receive the, the feedback. So uh, to, in order to improve our digital events offering, the next uh, event will be on 23rd November. So for supporting self-care, so throat, a critical, uh, um, a a critical thematic to pharmacists, uh, to the community pharmacists. All events um, uh, are available on FIP uh, website. And uh, once again, we want to thank to Reckitt for supporting this online program. Thank you very much and a good day to you all. Thank you.